To understand why this all happened, we must first take a quick look at the state of the Russian Empire during the years leading up to its collapse. You see, life during Imperial Russian rule wasn't exactly peaceful or stable. Welcome to Captain History Presents The Russian Revolution. There are plenty of reasons for the Russian Revolution, but for the sake of simplicity, we've listed the main four contributions of what meant the Russian people revolt and remove the entire imperial nobility out of power in just one week. First was the cultural stagnation. During this period in history, most nations were experiencing a revolution spurred by the advancements in technology and industry, as well as new political and cultural ideals. Basically, they were modernizing, and they were modernizing fast. Meanwhile, over in Russia, while some technological improvements were embraced, new ideals were often rejected or straight up censored by the regime and its nobility, since these modern ideas of state exposed them as the bad guys and the root of a lot of problems within the country. Which, you know, was true. They really sucked at state building, and the people were increasingly getting aware of that. So, this dismissal of modernization basically left them in a weird position, where in many places, especially outside major cities, where any industry they had was concentrated, life in Russia was akin to that of a peasant in the 1700s. The regime's failure to modernize their social and economic structures led to them being viewed as the hillbillies of Europe by most of the other European powers. This ties in perfectly to the second reason for the people's anger at the Romanovs, the loss of international status and national pride. It's important to remember that during this period in history, nationalism was very much in fashion. You know, the belief that your country was the very best and everyone else needed to be either conquered or removed off of the face of the earth. Yeah, that one. So, amid this global race for dominance, Russia was doing rather poorly. With their hillbilly reputation, the lack of many modern amenities enjoyed by rival nations and the horrendous beating Japan dealt them in 1905, the Russian people were furious at the ineptitude of the Tsar. This leads us to our third point, imperial corruption, mismanagement and oppression. The years leading up to the February Revolution were marked by rampant corruption among high government officials, blatant nepotism, mismanagement or in some cases no management at all by the imperial crown who was busy doing, well, Things? Nothing. They were doing nothing, except losing wars and eating plenty while their country starved. This resulted in a disjointed state apparatus that was pretty much useless to the regular citizen and only served the wealthy and powerful. Not only that, but when the common folk demanded for change, they were more often than not brutally suppressed by the order of the crown, such as Bloody Sunday during the revolution of 1905. That whole mess resulted in the creation of the Duma which was basically a lower house of parliament to, at least in theory, keep the Tsar in check. However, that soon proved to be useless due to the Tsar's total veto power, which naturally was not well received by the people. And to accompany these matters, there was another issue abroad. Our final point, Russia's involvement in World War I. Though initially viewed as a good thing by the Russian people, mostly because of a nationalist fervor and the renewed rivalry with Germany. Once the casualty reports and domestic shortages started hitting, Public support took a nosedive. As more and more men went off to fight, Russian industry was left with fewer men to keep the country running. When many of those men didn't return, it became worse. Fewer hands in the field meant smaller harvests. Fewer machines meant fewer factory goods. Fewer conductors and maintenance crews meant longer waits for supply movement. What little food and goods the Russians did produce took forever to get to where it needed to be. With those supply chain problems, a widespread famine increasingly became the norm as the war dragged on. Over at the front lines, things were not looking good either. Despite the initial success, the war quickly ground to a halt. The Tsar's hand-picked officer corps were inexperienced and backwards-minded, even for the Great War standards, so many of their gains were lost by the time of the revolution. It certainly didn't help that the Tsar Nicholas himself pointed him to be the supreme commander of the Russian forces to improve his public image. The move backfired because by this point he was already too disliked and the public considered him incapable of leading. So with his people starving and troops dying, his image beyond repair and his officials back home doing little to fix the situation, the stage was set for revolution. In order for the main event to make sense, we've got to cover the rest of the revolutions and uprisings happening across Eastern Europe. After all, historical events never happen in isolation. Expansionist campaigns by previous Tsars made the Russian Empire massive by the time the Great War erupted. As you may have guessed, these territories used to be sovereign nations and thus did not like being subjects of Russia. 
all of these territories wanted to rule themselves on their own terms. So taking advantage of the chaos in central Russia, they organized their own uprisings in one of the greatest, you know, reverse plays in history. For many revolutionaries, this would result in independence. One of the most notable revolutionary countries was Finland, which was under Russian control since it was taken from the Swedes in 1809. Strong feelings of self-determination were always present, and now they were greatly boosted by the introduction of nationalist ideologies to the country. And so, with all the turmoil developing in Russia, the constitutionalists saw their opportunity for freedom and went for it. Along with social democrats, the constitutionalists organized a national strike and Finland reclaimed its national autonomy in March 1917. In November 1917, Lenin recognized Finland as a free country. It would have been betrayal not to do so as he took refuge in Finland during the crackdown of the Bolshevik party by the Russian government. So this Polish-Soviet war is post-revolution in the time period but we felt it important to add it before we explain how the revolution itself took place. So let's get on to that. So the Polish, led by Josef Pilsudski, staged a successful uprising against the long-term German overlords that would conclude with the creation of the Second Polish Republic after the Treaty of Versailles was signed. Now the treaty ratified their independence and established the borders for a new Polish state and Poland began expanding to, to newly created Lithuania and Ukraine and obviously on this, this didn't go over well with the Soviets so on the 14th of February 1919 Russia declared war on the Polish Republic beginning the Polish-Soviet War. Now despite almost collapsing under a Soviet counter-offensive the Poles managed to rally at the Battle of Warsaw and win an astonishing victory that changed the course of the war. Seeing the Soviet forces on the run until the end of the war with the signing of a peace treaty that saw Poland gain considerable ground and foiled Soviet ambitions to bring communist rule further west. For now. Amidst all this chaos were the newly formed countries of Lithuania and Ukraine, threatened by both Poland and Soviet Russia. Lithuania managed to repel Polish attempts of conquest and remained independent. Ukraine however did not share that same fate. Despite proclaiming its independence, the country soon found itself in trouble with the Poles invading from the west and the Soviets from the east. At the Peace of Riga, Poland and the Soviets agreed to divide Ukraine between themselves, tossing the alliance they had with the Ukrainians out the window and killing all hopes for a free Ukraine. And like that one part went to Poland and the other one became a Soviet puppet state. Ukraine would not regain its independence until the fall of the Soviet Union seven decades later, and even today, she's still not out of the woods. Now with all that out of the way, let's turn our attention to the main course, the Russian Revolution. Side note, Russia during this time period used the Julian calendar, so most events are 13 days behind our current dating system. Let's move on. So what would be known as the February Revolution began on the 18th of February 1917, after a strike was organized in the Putilov factory, the largest in Petrograd. Petrograd, which was formerly known as St. Petersburg, but was renamed because of Petersburg sounding too German-like. The February Revolution started as a general strike to demand better working conditions and more food after a group of workers were fired from the Putilov factory. It quickly descended into city-wide anarchy that saw the regime disposed in just 12 days. Years of imperial incompetence and mistreatment created the perfect climate for such an event to happen so fast as spontaneously. During the revolt, civilians poured out into the streets to demand food and the end of the war. They stormed government buildings and faced off against loyalist forces. Many of the royalist forces deserted and joined the protesters' side, bringing their guns with them. On the 27th of February, the Petrograd Soviet emerged once more. The Petrograd Soviet was created during the Revolution of 1905 as a body of representatives elected by the workers to push for change against the government, but was dissolved shortly after. With all hell breaking loose in the streets, they saw the opportunity to resurface now that the regime's days were counted. The same day the Soviet was re-established, a provisional government, made out of ex-Duma members, was created in the direct defiance to the Tsar, pronouncing itself as the acting government body. Just three days later, Nicholas II was forced to abdicate and when his brother refused to take the crown, the Romanov dynasty collapsed. Once the dust had settled, two factions were left in control of the now disunified Russia, the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet. And boy did they hate each other. Like, not even a month had passed since the revolt and they were already mad at each other. This conflict became known as the April-May Crisis, and it went as such. The provisional government argued for the continuation of Russia's involvement in World War I, saying that it was in the nation's best interest to defend itself to ensure the survival of Russia. Contrasted by the Soviets who demanded the withdrawal of Russia from the war and the right of self-determination for the states that until then were part of the empire, with some of them having already rebelled. Looking at you three, these would be allowed to become independent. After some back and forth, the Soviets forced the government to send a declaration to the Entente stating that Russia would seek for durable peace 
on the basis of self-determination. Which is a fancy way of saying, please let us have peace without getting scammed at the negotiations. And so the government sent a declaration, but not before this one guy, by the name of Pavel Milyakov, Mil <coughs> Russia's Minister of Foreign Affairs, decided in his infinite wisdom and with the government's approval to write a secret note at the end of the declaration stating that Russia would remain faithful to the Allies and the war effort and that Russia would not pull out of the conflict. Soon after the Soviets found out and let's say they were not thrilled, protests immediately broke out demanding the resignation of both the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of War. The government had no choice but to give in to the demand since there's nothing they could really do to stop the Soviets of just barging in and making the decision themselves considering the Soviets consisted of the workers and the soldiers. This crisis, if anything, served to prove to everyone who was really in power, and it definitely was the Soviets. They had the support of the people on account of being elected by them, as opposed to the provisional government made out of the remnants of the old regime. And more importantly, the Soviets had a crap ton of soldiers, so they had to be treated carefully if one wanted to avoid being deposed and becoming Swiss cheese. Quick side note, during this period, Lenin released his now famous April Thesis, which was a manifesto that outlined the main priorities for his new Russian state, and he denounced the provisional government as inept and controlled by the bourgeoisie. Okay, so after the April-May crisis was over, a new minister of war was put in place by the name of Alexander Kerensky, who will be a pretty important guy during the rest of this story. He was a staunch believer in Russia's participation in the war, so against any common sense and completely ignoring what had just happened to the previous guy for trying the exact same thing, he launched what would be known as the Kerensky Offensive. As you can imagine, most people, including the Soviets, were intensely pissed about this and immediately took to the streets to show it. On the front lines, the Kerensky Offensive was pushed back and lost ground, with desertion rates and disobedience at sky-high levels. To the surprise of no one, the offensive was a failure. Back home in Russia, a little-known political party by the name of the Bolsheviks took the lead of the protests, despite having little to do with the organization of said protests. They did so to boost their popularity and clean their reputation of being a Western tool, since there was, and still is, evidence that suggests that the leader Lenin was aided by Germany in his struggle to get back into the country to kickstart a revolution. Once everything had cooled down, the provisional government began pursuing Bolshevik leaders and outlawed the Bolshevik party, in a manner very reminiscent of the old regime. In the middle of all of this, Kerensky is promoted to Prime Minister, for some reason. Honestly, we have no clue. This whole mess was basically his fault, so he gets promoted? Anyway, let's continue. After that whole debacle, Kerensky organizes the Moscow Conference, with the objective of sorting out what the hell to do about the war. Representatives of all interest groups were invited, except the Bolsheviks, of course, since they weren't allowed to hang with the cool kids anymore. The negotiations reached the same standstill as they did during the April-May crisis, but during these, a new player in the political field had emerged, Lavrov Kornilov. A decorated general of the Russian army, a former Cossack from humble origins, he was being hailed as a new option for the right wing and those in favor of the war. Though at first Kerensky saw him as a like-minded ally, he soon felt envy to a paranoia of a coup d'etat. So he had the fantastic idea of directly denouncing him out of nowhere as an enemy of the revolution. Kornilov wasn't happy about this betrayal, so he marched to take Petrograd and to depose the provisional government. Kerensky was unable to organize an effective resistance since most of the city's garrison was under Soviet influence. He pleaded with the previously imprisoned Bolsheviks, including Trotsky, for help. This put the final nail in the coffin for the provisional government, as they now showed themselves as incompetent politicians unable to defend the revolution, while showing the Red Guard as defenders of the revolution. Once assembled, the Red Army marched to meet the incoming military force. In the end, the invading forces were disarmed without bloodshed and they wound up joining the Soviets, further bolstering their strength. In the scramble for the defense of Petrograd, the Bolsheviks had positioned themselves as the saviors and organizers of the revolution. Through excellent oratory by Lenin and rigorous propaganda campaigns, the people saw the Bolsheviks as saviors. The Bolsheviks were quickly gaining massive popularity and managed to establish themselves as the leading Soviet political party. This would enable them to take control of the Russian political landscape and allow them to set the stage for the October Revolution where the Bolshevik party would take over and Lenin's ambitions would be realized. Soon after this brazen move, the now infamous Russian Civil War would take place and it would change Russia's fate forever. Uh, quick side note again everybody, um, there's a link in the description explaining Russia's political landscape prior to the revolution. Um, I thought it was a bit too long for the video and maybe not exactly what you wanted to see, but I think it is quite important uh, to have a look at that. And this is actually a huge part of our script. Um, 410 words is pretty 
pretty legible. Um, so yeah, that's in the description if you want to read that. So um, let's uh, go on to the big second act of the story, the Bolshevik Revolution. It's October 1917. The Bolsheviks now held the majority among the Petrograd Soviets, and they were getting ready to strike. As decided by Lenin and his Bolshevik Central Committee, the Military Revolutionary Committee was ready to begin operations. This committee consisted of Bolshevik-influenced military servicemen, taken from the Petrograd garrison and was aligned with the Red Guard. On the 24th of October 1917, the Bolshevik armed forces had occupied the train stations, the bridge over the Neva River, the National Bank and the Telephone Exchange and many other key locations in preparation for the attack. This forced Kerensky to leave Petrograd in fear for his life. On the 25th, MRC forces went on to surround the Winter Palace, where the Provisional Government resided. Things were not looking good for them. Units of artillery, cadet schools, officers, Cossacks and a women's battalion defended the minister's side. They were no match for the thousands surrounding them. Yet the storming of the Winter Palace was without bloodshed. At 6.15pm the Winter Palace was abandoned by hopeless artillery cadets and they were followed by 200 Cossacks at 8pm. The Bolsheviks issued an ultimatum to the stubborn ministers inside and at 9.45pm the famous battlecruiser Aurora fired a blank shot to assert dominance. By midnight the Winter Palace was completely overrun and the ministers of the provisional government surrendered. Except Kerensky. He was on his way back to Petrograd hoping to smash down the revolution with an army of Cossacks. Except he didn't. Lenin proclaimed the replacement of Kerensky's government with the People's Council of Commissars, better known as Sovnarkom. Quite conveniently, he was its leader since both the Mensheviks and Socialist Revolutionaries who were present in the Second Congress of Soviets left the Congress in a sign of protest when electing the leader of the new Soviet government after finding out what was going back on at the Winter Palace. This would prove to be a huge mistake since it left Trotsky and by extension Lenin, who wasn't present at the Congress, virtually unopposed at the Congress, just as they planned. It was in that Congress that Lenin announced he'd represent the democratic election of the Russian Constituent Assembly, which would have replaced the Provisional Government. But the Socialist Revolutionary Party got more votes and Lenin was furious. This was not part of the plan. So he dissolved the Constituent Assembly with help of his Red Guard. Yeah, that whole respecting democracy thing didn't last long as you can see. The councils of people's commissars with Lenin as its chairman ended up not being provisional anymore. The Bolsheviks were in charge. Many attempts of resistance were made, most notably in Moscow, where armed opposition lasted for two weeks before finally being put down, and fierce fighting was also seen in many places where ethnic non-Russians were a majority, seeing this as a chance of earning their freedom. But in the end, the Bolshevik revolution was successful, and Russia was now in their control. Later, they had secretly executed the Romanovs far away from the public eye. Their corpses were mutilated and buried in secret locations. The Bolshevik grip strengthened over Russia. Not long after, tensions would continue to rise and soon fellow countrymen would fight against each other for the fate of their nation. Red army on one side, white army on the other, in one of the bloodiest civil wars in history, the Russian Civil War.